morning, everybody. Again, 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 again. Uh, as we get ready to get back in our study, another honor, I've just, uh, again, the scripture tells us to honor those who deserve honor. And uh, we do want to welcome Paul Mitchell, who's in the house with us today. He's been a very long-term Christian and a pastor for over 30 years. And uh, so we will applaud you just to give you a little hint of what the other side of glory might look like when you get home. So we appreciate your service, sir. So with that, let's get back into our study. As most of you know, um, <clears throat> as we've been in the parks, we've really been digging into the beginning of the books of the book of Acts, uh, when Jesus commissioned the church, when he started the church age by sending back into heaven after his resurrection. Uh, he was very clear on what our purpose was, was to lead people to Jesus, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to disciple one another, to obey everything he's commanded of us because he loves us and doesn't want us off in the ditch someplace. And he uh, also gave them a map of where to do that, Jerusalem, their hometown, Judea, their country, Samaria, which are people that are different than them because there's no place for racism or discrimination within the body of Christ, and uh, also all the ends of the earth. So we are, as we have spent the last two years on discipleship and on Jesus and the biblical Jesus, are moving into how do we take that forward, and that's why we wanted to go into the community in the parks because the first several chapters really kind of highlight that first step of uh, what their ministry looked like within their hometown. We will get to the other areas as well, and even see a hint of it again today, but primarily within their hometown. And we've seen an overlying theme, a couple of them actually, of kind of an up and down roller coaster ride, if you've been with us. Uh, we started out and Jesus would say, hey, this is, the, this is this ministry that you're called to, that you're purposed for, uh, but don't do it yet. We had that non, not yet season where they were together in prayer, they were together in the scripture, they were together in worship, and they were together uh, in, in unity with one another. And then chapter two hit, right? And we got this roller coaster spike of Pentecost and the filling of the Holy Spirit and going out and teaching. Uh, and just an amazing message that Peter, as well as the other apostles, but Peter specifically stands out just because he was denying Christ in the same culture or not, but. but two months before. And so now that we see 3,000 people come to the Lord, it's an incredible moment. Uh, there, there's healings. And then with that healing, well, uh, one specifically of a lame man, things kind of went back down again. We, we had where they were arrested, they were on trial. We see, uh, and, and, and again, you, you, all these are available online if you want to see what I'm talking about. But uh, we see a time where I think, at least with Peter and John, because they were the ones that were kind of really threatened to shut up to not be in the court judge, to not cause problems, that they weren't defeated, but they were depleted. That that took, the Holy Spirit spoke through them, and they said, listen, we got to follow God, not you. But nonetheless, they felt pretty beat up, and they went back, and they got into unity, into prayer, into the scripture, uh, into worship. And we see a second move of the Holy Spirit filling them again, and we moved up to unity again, and we saw where everybody was being taken care of, so we're back up on this high. And then Ananias and Sapphira happened. We looked at that last week. And now there's a lot of turmoil from Ananias and Sapphira to people that were not um, following and were lying to the Holy Spirit, and uh, God took the life over it. And that, that, that's a more complicated study. We did that last week. Again, that's available for you. But now we've kind of got this, again, not defeated, but just kind of uh, hard stuff. So now we've got to see where we go from there. So with all of this is happening within Jerusalem for 95% mark. So we're going to pick it up there. At that low, where do things go? So if you would, let's get our Bibles out. We're going to Acts chapter 5, uh, verse 12. I believe it is. Yep, but verse 12 is where we're going to pick up the testimony. And we're going to see where God takes them from this very serious kind of ominous moment and what things we can learn from it ourselves within our own scripture. Now, the, the sin has been dealt with within the house, which had to happen because um, sin can't stay in the house. That needs to be addressed, and uh, but now we're going to see where things kind of go back up a little bit. So all that to say, don't worry if you have some ups and downs in your lives. That's normal. It's the Holy Spirit that continues to fill us and continue to anoint us and continue to move us forward for the sake of the Lord. So with that, let's dig on in. Don't try to hide. I see you back here, Mayor. I mean, you're sneaking in with Trey. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way that you're sneaking in with Trey. So anyways... <clears throat> Uh, again, you versions up and running. If you use the app, uh, that gives you all the scriptures and a place to take notes. Um, and then again, if you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in the baskets around the, the, the room that you can keep borrowed still. So let's dig in. Like I said, read a little, talk a little, and see what we find out. 
So after all this happened with Ananias and Sapphira, now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, uh, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So I want to this because there's a lot within this. We have seen them on trial. We've seen them threatened with their lives. You're not allowed in the synagogue anymore. This is not the first time we've seen Solomon's porch though, right? The Solomon's portico. This is the exact same place where they got arrested when they told them, you're not allowed to preach anymore. You're not allowed to talk anymore. You're not allowed in the synagogue anymore. They were right back to it because they're following what they said. We've got to do what God tells us to do and not what man tells us to do. And so th with boldness that they've been praying for with the Holy Spirit, they're still doing the ministry and they're still moving forward into this place. But you'll notice a little bit of a change that you notice that most of the people are too scared to be, be there. Did you see that? That they're out there, they're preaching, they're teaching, people come to the Lord. Um, it, it's a great revival going on, but for those that were believers before, they're scared to go out there. And there's two possible reasons why, why they're scared. I, I would say obviously because of the threats of the synagogue leaders and that, that the arrests that they went through and the threats that they made and those type of things are going to be there. Um, I do believe that there's probably also some fear over what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. That everything was great and dandy when we're all taking and sharing with each other and we love each other and the scripture and we're doing communion we're in each other's homes we're at the synagogue together and all these things are great. But all of a sudden the, the heaviness of what sin does the, the, the holiness of God can be overwhelming. And so I would assume some people are like, uh, what does this mean? What just happened? And, and am I right with God before I walk into the synagogue? Is he going to take my breath away? You know what I mean? Like there, there'd be a heaviness there. And I would think, as we've been talking about, and we'll talk about a little bit more today, raising expectations and raising our understandings, we could actually kind of benefit a little bit from that kind of understanding. Am I right with God? Are there areas that I'm struggling with? Are there areas that I'm, I'm holding on to even though I know it's not of him, that it's against what the scripture tells me or his best for me or what he's purposed me to do? It's kind of like this healthy attitude, but, the, but I, I, would th I would think for them there's just kind of this ominous feel of what does all this mean to this beautiful community we had? Um, and I think God's tending to that. I believe God can do any miracle, any time, any way, shape, or form that he wants to do it. He's God. I believe in this moment, he's doing miracles to tell them, look, I'm still in charge. Look, I still love you. Look, I still got you in my hands. Look, I'm still, I'm here for this, this community. And so they're, they're seeing this constant moving of God to be able to, um, to reassure them and to empower them and encourage them instead of hiding in the, the back hallways. But even with all this going on, did you notice that more people are coming to the Lord now than ever? The first time we looked at him, 3,000 people came to the Lord one day. Holy cow, that's a big revival. Last time we talked about 2,000 more people came to the Lord. Now more people than them were coming to the Lord. So God would still walk through the hardship, and God would still minister as they go through. Actually, the only people that we really see out here that are uh, with the apostles, who are in high regard, and we hope they don't kill you, um, is the people that are desperate. All the people that are desperate, that their desperation is greater than their fear. And uh, I do believe, once again, that's another way we can grow in. Some of us need to be more desperate. Some of us need to be more desperate for the Lord so that we'll lean into him and the other things don't matter. But they're, they're bringing in the, the, the sick. They're bringing in the people that are struggling. Um, and one of the things that we'll see within this, not only that they're, that they're being healed, but when it comes to that raised expectation, um, the people are getting it. I don't know if we are fully yet, but the people are getting it. Again, when we talk about Pentecost and it's not yet season, they're praying for 10 days. They're, they're trying to get ready for the unknown. They don't really know how this is all going to look, how that's going to play. And what the Holy Spirit did through Pentecost blew, blew them away because it was beyond any expectation that they had. Here, the people are saying, all I know is his healing and deliverance is there. And I need to be there. They're coming with an expectant heart to the point that, well, maybe even Peter's shadow would just kind of brush up against them and they'll be healed. The scripture doesn't tell us whether or not that happens. Uh, personally, I think it did because their expectation and their faith was so high that God honored that and that he, he did miracles 
and the, the code needs this is held to every, everybody in this particular setting. So th there's some really beautiful things in here as far as expectation as well. But the biggest thing I want to point out is that the key to all of this working really is humility. Is humility. And since we're back and we have TV screens again, I'll give you notes. Um, it, for our note now, most of you guys are like, oh, I forgot we brought journal like journals and notes to church because we got lazy in the park. But if you're taking notes, look what humility did. They would not have been saved if there was not humility, first and foremost, within this. They're scared, but they're growing because they're still leaning into the Lord. They're uncomfortable, but it's growing because they're still seeking after Jesus. They're, they're still empowered in, in the midst of their turmoil because of the power of the Holy Spirit that resides within them for those who've accepted Jesus as leader and forgiven their lives. So through, through their humility, they're able to say, I need you. You are the Son of God. You died and rose again for me, and I want to follow you. This, 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 whatever this is, you have a purpose for it. You have a plan for it, and I want to lean into that, and I want to follow you. That only comes when you put yourself away, and you open yourself up to humility, through humility of Christ. Uh, through humility, people are loved. But I might get arrested, I might get but I need him. I need healing. I need a salvation. And they will be able to be loved on with care and unity amongst the group, even though there was challenge from the outside world. Uh, through that humility, they were able to be healed. They will be healed and be able to have that knowledge that God does heal when God's will is there to be healed. And I can seek after that. And humility comes. Why did I put humble up there? If you're humble, you're humble. It's supposed to be delivered. With, with, with humility comes deliverance. If I continue to say, no, it's going to be my way, or this is what I'm comfortable with, or no, God, I'm not going to follow you in this particular area, there is no deliverance because we block the spirit. Over and over again, remember, the biggest thing that blocks the spirit is ourselves. And so this is what we see. That, again, there's this beautiful uphill, great pivotal moment because they were letting the spirit move and not getting in his way. Verse 17. <clears throat> But, again, always look for these conjunction words, but, and, it always means it's in, in connection with whatever's around it, and you want the full context of things. Even though all this awesome stuff's going on, the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. This is the main switch between these two stories that are connected with each other. We are now moving from humility into another motive, another way that we can react, which is jealousy. And when I say jealousy, I'm meaning self. Jealousy equals self, that I want what I want. So because of that, because that lens that they have, we're going to see that the high priest, once again, in the Sadducees, react in a completely different way than all those that are being touched by the Lord and experiencing his freedom and his healing. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, because they're filled with jealousy. Jealousy of the power, jealousy of the message. Uh, they don't believe in miracles, Sadducees. They don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, they don't like the teaching that they have there. Um, and today, when you are reaching the community around you, whether that be your work, your job, your home. I say work, your job. It's like saying humble is humble. Work, uh, school, activities, community, grocery store, whatever the case may be. Whenever we experience God, there's got to be a reaction. And some, sometimes, oftentimes, the world is going to choose jealousy or self over humility before God. And so that's one of the reasons we're studying this as, you, as you're reaching out to other people. Uh, and hopefully, maybe even something you need to work on in your own life. But they're filled with jealousy. So here's what they do. Verse 18. They arrested the apostles, and they put them in public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life, capital L, talking about the gospel. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Uh, did I mention some of this is funny? Some of this is really funny to me. Like when you, when you take and just read this and you go, oh, yeah, I remember that story when I was in VBS, blah, blah, blah. But when you read this with the educated biblical imagination, I was, this is funny to me. But the Sadducees are like, we're going to arrest them. And I'm telling you, last time we tried to shut them down and they didn't get it, we're going to shut them down this time. Let them sit there in jail and think about it overnight and we'll deal with them in the morning. And God's like, hey guys, go out there and preach some more. I love that. 
I love that. I don't know. I think uh, he, he's doing a jab for the, all the right reasons. He, he's poking for all the right reasons. 100% love, 100% truth. So they go out and they're in the exact same place where they were arrested yesterday, doing the exact same thing that they were arrested for. Now, in the second one, that's obviously alien technology. 21B. <laughs> Now, when the high priest came and those who came with, uh, were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and they sent to the prison to have them brought. Again, biblical imagination. There's a lot of ego in this room of shutting this down. But when the officers came, they did not find them in prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and all the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. They are not wondering what happened. Just make sure you kind of get that little, little point there. They're not wondering what happened. They're wondering what does this come to? What does this mean to us? What happens if people find out that they got out of prison overnight? What happens when this momentum shifts? What does this mean to us? This shows the motivation of the jealousy. So they're wondering, what, what will this become? What will come out of this? And someone came and told them, hey, look, these men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but they not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Billion things we can break out of this. The one thing that I, I, I want to share with you, again, outside of the fact that I just love how God works. Um, and what you get to be a part of if you're bold enough to follow him, um, is this last line that everything has turned, and now they're not bringing them by force because they're afraid of being stoned by the people. We'll see that they don't mind abusing the apostles. They just want to do it behind closed doors because the people, the culture has shifted overnight. It has now gone from something that they can intimidate and arrest them in public, but now the people, the culture has shifted to the point that they're intimidated within those the other theories. Do you see, see that change? And, and the reason I want to bring that up, again, as we minister into this world, and, and, and again, I'm not trying to hit hot-button topics or make anybody mad, but sometimes that happens. Um, this shows us how the Holy Spirit changes culture, not us, not, not the, the plans of man. This, this is how the Holy Spirit will change culture. We live in a pretty jacked-up world. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. Uh, if I just dive down to uh, church life, Christianity, uh, you know, I was raised in the 70s and the 80s, which sounds like a long time ago now. It is not. Um, <laughs> but how people looked at church, how people looked at Christianity was very different in those days. Uh, Christianity was considered favorable. We're now, we don't see those same numbers and statistics of how people see Christians. Um, there was no way that a school would ever dare schedule a sporting event or a music event on a Sunday morning or even a Wednesday night. Those were sacred. You just don't do that. Th things have, have changed a lot. Um, I will say some of that I believe is our fault and some f is th the church. I mean the, the world and real things have gone within the world. And for the old timers, uh, some of us have a rubber band effect to that. Uh, rubber band effects are pretty much uh, all over the place, but where something uh, carries to an extreme that when it snaps back, it goes to another extreme, uh, and it's not always necessarily figured out how to do it well. Um, and so there, there are those who get scared about our cultures shifting so much over the last 40 years um, to the point that we get angry about it or fearful about it or sad about it, and we, we, we take and start looking for uh, the right... Um, uh, the right leader or the right um, government people or the right movement or whatever the case may be to get back what we want, to get back what we want instead of taking and following the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit leads us to that and the Holy Spirit changes culture. And I truly believe the church would have a different impact today if we were trusting the Holy Spirit instead of trying to maneuver our own things uh, because the world sees that and they judge us off of that. You know, do you know what I mean? The, the, the scripture says he, th they'll know us by our love, not by our memes. So something to think about there, and this is something that happens uh, with this. I don't know what you guys are laughing about. Uh, I wasn't referring to anything. Uh, so so there are a few people. There's a culture changing here, and that, that has to happen because persecution is starting to increase. It's starting to increase. 
Okay, so, um, feels like I missed something, but I don't think so. Okay. 27, let's see what goes from there. When they had brought them, okay, so now they're bringing them into the council, and <clears throat> set them before them. The high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet here, uh, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. In other words, you're blaming us for this. But Peter and the apostles answered pretty similarly to what the Holy Spirit told them to last time. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God had given uh, to those who obey him. So again, it's kind of a, a similar exchange where they bring up the same points. We're going to obey God, not you. We need to really embrace that if you're going to be living the mission, if you're going to do the Great Commission. Because sometimes that's not, oh, my boss says I can't do this, so, but I have to follow God, not you. Sometimes you say, I don't want to do this, and you have to do it because God's calling you to do it. Oh, that's outside my comfort zone. Okay, pray about it, get some boldness, go do it. You know, so, so I've got to do what God calls me to do, not what man does. Uh, you, you love this accusation that they're trying to lay his blood at your feet. Uh, yeah, you did it. I mean, you, you were part of that. We can't deny that. We're just laying out the, the truth of it, not, um, not my personal beliefs as truth, but that was the truth of it. Uh, and then um, you killed Jesus, who is prince, which means he is the son of God. It means he is in charge of all. It does mean that he is God, that he's part of the triune um, God that we serve. You killed the Savior who came, left heaven, took a huge hit just to come down to this cesspool, to be able to live the life, to die and to raise again for him. You, you killed the prince and the savior. That, that's just on, on the record. But look what God did with it. And look how God raised him up. Look how God offers you forgiveness. Look how, this, this is the message. We, we really don't care about what you guys are, are getting worked up about. We just need to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. That, that's what we are doing. We are witnesses. And we are stewards of what we have witnessed. Them you, me, we're stewards, we're in charge, charged with spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, now, whenever you have a message like this and you get into stuff, whenever you come up against God, it calls for a reaction. You have no choice on it, it's just what it is. They have now been presented the truth of Jesus Christ and you have to choose how you're going to react to it. That's just life. You can either lean into it and be up like these guys back here and what is under my orange highlighter, which means nothing to you, or you can be like these green jealousy guys, right? So, Let's see how they react, because I'm sure they're going to lean into it, right? That's going to be beautiful, just beautiful. 33, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Okay, so it didn't go that way. Um, they chose a different way to go. They embraced jealousy instead of the humility. James, James tells us um, that if we humble ourselves, that he will lift us up. And that's when you have a strong foundation on your feet. When we lift ourselves up, it doesn't go that well. This, this is the path that they have chosen, and they uh, want to kill them. However, again, verse 34, the word but. This is our continuation. But that's the situation, but this is what happens. A Pharisee in the council named um, Gamaliel. Am I pronouncing that correctly close enough, guys? Gammy. Gammy. A teacher of the law held in honor by all the people stood up, and he gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care of what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. And he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or if this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it's of God, you would not be able to overthrow them. You might even be, be found opposing God. He did several shocking things within this that nobody else, I believe, could have done. One, he got them to stop in their rage, their murderous rage, their foaming at the mouth rage, and put the guys outside for a second. That, that, that this was a mob situation, and he said put him outside, so they put him outside. That means he has a great deal of respect, a great deal of authority. 
he says, here's some logic to hold on to. We have nothing that says that he is a Christian. He is looking at it from a logical standpoint and how things have gone before. Here's some logic for you to consider. But the thing that kills me, that shows me how much authority and respect he had, is he said, if this is of God, that would have been blasphemy to them. In this moment, for everything they want to squash, he had the dacity say, what if this is of God? And if it is, you're opposing God. And for them to hear that for even a moment shows how much authority and respect he had. Um, he was actually, the, the other uh, rulers of the law, if you go back in church history, his nickname was the beauty of the law. That's what the other teachers called him. That, again, the law is what they worshiped. The law is what they were completely uh, centered about. And this guy was just the beauty of the law. He just exhibited it. He was the guy. This guy had many uh, famous disciples. Uh, he was very hard to become a, a, your rabbi. And Paul, Saul, was, was one of his students, one of his disciples. So we see him have a lot of influence within this particular uh, situation. And it's what I call uh, he, he spent his currency. And uh, I don't think I've ever talked about that before. It's something I think about in my relationships. Um, not as much like how to have this to be able to get this done, but as much as I just see it happen. Between you and I, and between you and any other person you know, we spend relational currency with one another. You know, if you, if you are someone who says, okay, I'm doing, let, let's say you're struggling with alcohol, and somebody that you don't know, and they're kind of annoying around the office, and you just don't really want to hear from them, come up and say, hey, I'm really concerned about you and how much you're drinking. You're like, don't come up to me and talk to me about my drinking. Just stay out of my life. That's one possible scenario. Your best friend since elementary school comes up to you and says, I'm really worried about you and your drinking. You're not going to respond the same way. There's a better chance that you're going to be like, man, is it that bad? Because you have a relational concurrency with each other, you have trust with each other, you know that they love you, you know um, that they, they would die for you. you. You have this relational concurrency with everybody at different levels and different amounts. And so a lot of times when um, I'm talking to somebody, maybe it's pastoral care, maybe it's just brother to brother or brother to sister, uh, friend to friend, whatever the case may be, I am aware of how much currency I have and it will dictate how I respond at that beginning. Um, I'll, for instance, uh, uh, f two, two friends of mine were going through a divorce and the husband was a goober. And um, I'd known him for a long period of time, had a lot of relationship with him. We had had multiple times that we sat uh, friend, friend to friend. And when we first started talking, I'm like, dude, I'm really, do you see what you're doing here? And you're, you're kind of concerned about that. And I noticed as we talked about it, and he was choosing self over anything humility-wise, that it started getting sharper and sharper because my currency was starting to run out. And so it had to become more direct. It had to become um, more like, dude, this is what the scripture said. And there came a point that he's like, I don't care what you say. I want to do what I want to do. And that currency was, was gone. Um, currency is something that we're stewards of. Okay, And I'm not saying I, uh, that if I meet somebody, um, if I'm in New York City and meet somebody on the subway and God says, tell them the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that I have the right to say, I'm sorry, God, I don't have enough currency with this person right now. I have to check all check. That's not what I'm saying. He'll, he'll call us outside of our comfort zones. But I think you guys are getting what I'm talking about with currency, right? And the main thing that I want you to realize is we talk about stewardship with our money. We talk about stewardship with our time. We talk about stewardship with our resources. We talk about stewardship with our spiritual gifts. You are a steward of the relationship, relational currency you have for the kingdom of God. And this is, we see it, even not from a Christian, here in a beautiful example of him saying, let's let these guys go. You guys keep making these guys motors. Just let them go and see if it falls apart because it's of God. You're going to lose. You're going to lose. So, verse 39, think about that though when it comes to your stewardship of your currency and how you're handling your relationships with the kingdom. Um, so they take his advice uh, and not st still being stuck in self. Uh, they, they called the apostles uh, and then they beat them and they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus because that worked so well. Uh, and then they let them go. And then they left the presence of the council rejoicing uh, for the, sorry, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the, na for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Jesus is 
the Christ. Again, he has never told us that we will not deal with conflict. He has never told us that we would not be beaten. He has never told us that we wouldn't be arrested or that we would lose friends or that somebody would get snotty with you on Facebook. He's never promised us any of that. Taste. He just told us he would go through it with us. And while we might be depleted at times, we would not be defeated if you're leaning into the Lord, if you're following the Lord's way of it and you're following it and it's a community. So just a couple, a couple of points uh, to give to you. And I, I well, yeah, I'm just going to skip that. The whole point, what, yeah, you can put it there. The whole point is if you do jealousy, you're not going to get the other things that humility brings to you, and then you'll be sad. Okay, so community notes, a couple things to pick up throughout this. First off, pick humility over jealousy every time. God, the Holy Spirit has put anything on you. I ruined the word of God today. You have a, re- a reaction to have. You either lean into it or you reject it. You always choose humility. Always let him lift you up. Second one I would give you is this. Uh, the things of God stands. The thing of God stands. And that's just in your regular life as well. They stand. So the question becomes, are there areas in your life that are God's and you're opposing God? The same advice that he gave to the high priest I would give to you today. Anything that you're taking and standing against that's of God, you're opposing God. Select that humility, lean into it, and see what he'll do with it. And then, second, and then the third one is this. Never cease the mission. Even with hardships that come, never cease the mission. You and I are here for a reason. I've told you this before when I taught in nursing homes, and I talked to people in the late 90s who were bedridden, wanting to, to be done and go to heaven. God wants us in heaven more than we do. I really do believe that. He wants us out of the sin and the smuck and the smire. So if Tom's still here, there's a reason for it. And I've seen people in the late 90s that are stuck in bed and they can't get out who have beautiful called ministries that encourage people left and right. What is he calling us to that we can continue to do the mission as long as he has us?